you want to move the primary to August? The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. You know, we get all jacked up if we have 20% turnout for a primary, for crying out loud. Now we're going to move it to August, but the data says it won't impact the turnout. The Secretary of State is here to tell us all about that, so we'll welcome her in momentarily. Glad to have you aboard. Grad? Oh, silly rabbit. Uh, glad to have you aboard. Thanks for tuning in. Let's cut to a couple of things that are happening on a local basis. I just wanted uh, to, to, to applaud the idea that overdose deaths are down on the opioid battle. But, you know, four or five percent is hardly anything to cheer about when we have so many hundreds of people on an annual basis who are succumbing to overdoses. And we haven't done any programming here on that in a short while. We really need to come back to it. You know, the numbers have been coming down. We did a ton of programs on it when the numbers were going up. Uh, I, I think getting relaxed about this is probably the biggest worry that everybody should have. I just want to make sure that everybody is still paying attention to a lot of the genesis of this problem, which is prescription drugs. You go to the dentist, you get some, you know, Vicodin or whatever you do, and you take the pills and you feel good and you take a few more. And, you know, when I had my teeth yanked, I took one and went, oh, do I feel terrible on this and put them away to then send to the police or drop to the police when the, you know, you depose, you dispose of, of the medicine, right? Uh, my point is, is that a lot of people get hooked on this accidentally. And next thing you know, you're a heroin addict. And next thing you know, you're getting, you know, nasal shot on the street because you're about to buy the farm. Be careful out there and make sure that everybody in the family is being careful out there. In the meantime, the Senate president is deciding he wants to tax the companies that are making this legal product and look, I understand the intent, but I, I, I just wish that every idea that we had that's good for the community doesn't come along with revenue attached to it, like taxes attached to it. Reportedly, $7.5 million is the goal of this tax on those specific companies. You're not going to cry a river over that, but I would like to see the proof down the line that there will be $7.5 million attached to the idea that we got to buy, what's the name of the drug? Naloxone, right? Because in our general fund, it just all disappears. You know, we tax people for a specific purpose, we estimate what the number will be, and then what happens, it just goes. We, we can't find it anymore. So, I understand the intent. It's not something that's going to hurt the broad base, but we ought to watch this very carefully and ask a lot of questions. In the meantime, the one thing that I think you need to feed back to the legislature on is this evergreen contract battle, which is back. I understand what the unions are trying to do here. Uh, this is an upper hand move on their part. I don't always disagree with the unions, but on this particular matter, uh, well, they think I always disagree with them, and I don't. But I will tell you that this contract um, provision, which allows for a contract to continue in its current form until such time as a new contract is renewed, uh, might work for an individual. I mean, I have that provision in my own agreement but doesn't necessarily work for a bargaining unit that has no incentive to come back, mostly in hard times. In good times, it's pretty jump ball. But in hard times, when a town or a city might have to make a move on a union just to save some money, they're locked out because the union doesn't have to come to the table because the existing agreement and all the numbers remain static. It's not a good bill to protect the municipalities and the taxpayers. And I'm telling you, on the heels of what happened with the overtime bill, with the firefighters, this is a bad trend. This is a, a different cycle that we're going through in the legislature right now. We're going to dig more on that and have a conversation with Bob Walsh from the National Education Association on some of these union negotiation matters and that teachers having sex with kids problem that we have a loophole on all tomorrow night. All right. In the meantime, uh, this is a what type of story? Dan McKee, Lieutenant Governor, is answering now for a trip he's going on 
and a trip he went on. So this is the headline, failed to, to um, uh, disclose the last trip. This is as silly as it comes, right? McKee went on a trip in 2017 to Taiwan, uh, put press releases out on it, discussed it thoroughly, nobody covered it, and he forgot to put in his little disclosure form to the Ethics Commission on this. Big mistake. You got to put your filings in. Our, our next guest will tell you she's, you know, the captain of paperwork. You've got to make sure that you got all your forms filed, but it certainly isn't something that he was hiding in the dark. Yet he had to answer for it today. He was on the radio on WPRO on the Tara Granahan show. And uh, as he was trying to explain himself, he probably didn't help himself. No, there's, there's no taxpayer dollars involved. The, the trip is grueling. I mean, uh, you know, to take a 15-hour, 16-hour plane flight each way, and then when you come back, uh, there's an adjustment of about uh, a day for every hour of the, of the time change. Uh, yes, I mean, it is an interesting, I grant you that. It's experiences that, you, you know, that most people haven't had, including myself. Uh, so that from that perspective, yeah, it is, but it's work, and uh, that's exactly what it is. All right, so the Blackstone Valley has got this deal going on with, tai with Taiwan. They've got the boats that they've got coming in to Pawtucket. Pawtucket needs the economic development. Uh, did he have to go over there to make sure the deal is working? No, the deal is already done. Uh, but they got a partnership, and it's paid for by Taiwan. There's no taxpayer money. There are 11 individuals in the Blackstone Valley, including the mayors of Central Falls and Pawtucket, some of the delegation, um, a couple of wives, spouses, whatever. Uh, it's no big deal. It's not a taxpayer problem. What they should have done is put a more formal release out to say, hey, by the way, we're celebrating Blackstone Valley. We've got this deal in Taiwan. This is what we're doing. We're going out there. At which time, they probably should have done some diligence and said, and by the way, we've got to file this form on our going, and oh my gosh, we didn't file the form in 2017. Instead, he's talking about how much work it is and how grueling the trip is. I mean, listen, my wife's a travel agent. I hear it all the time. Overseas travel can knock you out, but it's not the military. Okay? So, Everybody just calm down and know that this was just one of those unnecessary stories mishandled. All right, let us talk about something very necessary, and that is we want to move an election? Get out of here. So we're we going to go to our, the polls in our bathing suits in August? Is that what we're doing? There she is, our Nelly, the Secretary of State. I will never get over that ad campaign. It is the best ad Thank campaign you. ever. Thank you. How are you? Very good, thanks. Go to Taiwan? No. No. I'm here. <laughs> Ever been to Taiwan? Nope. No. Have not. Want to go to Taiwan? At some point in my yeah, life. Some point in life. Put it on your bucket list. Mm -hmm. um, what are you cooking up here? Give, no. me, give so me the executive actually, summary on this. So, so this, I actually had put this bill in before last year. Um, what's happening is this. Look, there's a federal law that requires uh, the states to send out ballots to military and overseas citizens a minimum of 45 days before the general election. And historically, we've met that deadline very, very closely. I mean, like literally from the day before kind of thing. Because what happens is we have some of the latest mm. primaries in, in the states. And, and, and what you'll see is that there's, there has been a trend to move by the states, their primaries into different months. But right now, we're one of five states left uh, and, and we already know that for 2020, we will not meet that law. Uh, now, what can happen? Well, the Department of Justice could sue us and take us to court and then say, if, you, if Rhode Island can't figure out how to do this and, and meet the calendar that we require it for, for our men and women in military uniform that are abroad, then they will do it for them. And I'm of the belief that it's better for us to figure out what the calendar should be than to have some federal court uh, decide for us. What does we do it for them mean? Uh, that the courts uh, come in and decide what the calendar, wh when the primary will be. Hmm. So, so you know, I'm a third generation Army uh, family member. Uh, my, my brother fought in Iraq. I, I, I feel very strongly that, you know, that our right to vote is really, you know, has been paid by blood and, and, and is being defended abroad. And I don't want it to be in my watch that we are violating those people's rights to receive their ballots in time to get them back. Because when you're sending a ballot overseas, I mean, once it's out of the U.S. Postal Service, you know, how do you know that it's going to get there in time if it, you don't have at least 45 days? So this is the exclusive motive. Mm -hmm. All right. But there's all sorts of ramifications. We'll talk about that next. 
So if you got a big screen, you can mm -hmm. see some of the dates right there in terms of who does mm -hmm. primaries when. Our Secretary of State is with us, and she's, um, uh, I guess, just motivated by this threat from the military. There's no other political no. nuance or thing about wanting to move primaries from. What, by the way, is it, I always, I always make this mistake. Is it up or back? Back. Back to, to August. August, or yeah. is it up? I think it's back to August. Or up because it's before. Maybe. Right. I'm not gonna argue. Anybody? That one. Anybody anyway, want to weigh in on that? Is it up or back? <laughs> From September so, to August. Yeah. No. Uh, you know, you so, can vote on it. Is it up or so, back? So uh, this is what's also happened. You know, so now you know. So Here you go. We have a lot more activities that happen. Like for example, you have to. So we have a seven-day period after an election. You know, you have the seven-day period where somebody can challenge. You've got recounts that happen. So it's not just you know the election is done and then we send out the ballots the next day. So there's a time period there. Um, so in this particular, for the 2020 cycle, this became very urgent because the general election day is November 3rd, which is the earliest it can be in November. Right. And the, the current date would be September 15th. And it's just, by the time you go through that week. One, two, yep. three, four, five, six, seven, seven weeks in yep. total. That's 42, seven times seven is 49, and yep. you have a 45 day mandate. And, and, and you, you have, have a seven day, seven wait, day period. wait period. You're not going to make it. No. And you got to print. And, and you, you got to, and, and you got to, and before you print, you've got to make sure that you've got everything right. So you also. Well, What's that know, time? Usually a week or two? No, no. Usually it's a couple of days. A few days. A couple of days. All right, so you're, gonna, like you're not going to make it. You're not going to make the 45 so, day mandate. So last year, I, in, I, in, I asked for this bill to be sponsored. Um, it didn't go anywhere, but it started to raise the visibility of the issue. And now, this year, I'm basically saying, look, we are not going to be in compliance. And the danger here, I mean, first and foremost, I want to make sure I get those military ballots in time to people. It's the right thing to do. Second, the Department of Justice could sue us on it, and then somebody else is going to take control over our election calendar. So let's have a conversation locally about what that election calendar should be. Now. Uh, my proposed new date is August uh, 18th. It's the it's the um, third Tuesday after the first uh, uh, Monday. It's, well, it's all, the law is really fun when you start reading it. But and it's so you know. And I was thinking, look, I'm not going to do it during uh, Victory Day week. I mean, I know that's a problem. But by that point of the third, the fourth week of August, more people are back and stuff. And you know, we do have mail ballots. We've got emergency mail ballots plus election day. So we yeah. do have a variety of ways in which people can vote. Uh, data on turnout mm -hmm. from states who have moved it into the summer? So, so interestingly enough, literally off the press, because if we had done this like a month ago, I, couldn't have did, I would have told you, despite the fact that people say you can't move it into a summer month because it, it will depress turnout, um, there was actually no data that showed one way or the other. Uh, but now the... Uh, bipartisan Policy Center has come out with a report, which interestingly enough shows that states that move their primary into either July or August have slightly higher turnout rates than those in either the spring or the fall. What do they and attribute so, that to? Uh, you know, it's, it's just data. It's just data. But given that you're a learned, interested man, well, oh, thanks. I got I some more. Thanks. That, that, that's for, that's for that page. Something like. <laughs> I'm like rubbing the host belly a little bit to make no, him feel I mean, good. You know. I got some work to do now. Okay. <laughs> uh, but no, I'm interested yeah. in that. I don't know what the dynamic would be. People are up and around more in the summertime? or Yeah, I, I think also, and, and maybe just people, I mean, let's face it. Not everybody can take vacations these days. There's a lot of people who are around and, and working. So, I, you know, I, I push back a little bit on the notion that everybody's on vacation and no, no one's going to be able to come in and vote. Although I did love the, uh, the the cartoon that was done where the, the polling location was next to the Quahog booth. Yeah, well, <laughs> this is not then, you're not going to make it for next year. No, no. Or we, you think you will with the bill? Uh, you this bill, do. if it passes, yes. And I want to thank uh, Rep Al Alzate and uh, Senator Reptakis who are helping me uh, sponsor this. Any thought yep. to, if you got to do it, like, you know, under yep. the adage of, if you're going to do it, let's do it, like bring it to June or... or, or, or the, so, there are so, states who do that, yes. and, and it feels like the, at least it's the end of the school year mentality, the, and July and August then become yep. the coast time. 
and then you have yourself a yeah. longer general election. Yeah. No. No, I know. So part of the but part of the crunch there then is the legislative session that we happen to have in other states. They don't have. They wrap up. Th early. They wrap up earlier. So. I was trying to look at the political landscape with a pragmatic eye, yeah, not a, yeah. you know, and say, okay, what is feasible that buys us a little bit of cushion so that we can meet our obligation to our military folks? Hmm. Yeah, God knows we don't want to disrupt that, you know, that mess in late June at the General Assembly where everything gets shoved through. Well, Even though Dick Battiel has done a better job yeah. of tempering mm -hmm. the 2 a.m.ers, yeah. but... Eh. It's, there's a lot going on at the time. And... It's not just the primary itself. It's it's the signature time. It's the declaration time. It's you know. So there's a, a whole calendar that backs up into that date. All right. When we come back, we talk a little bit about the idea of early voting in general. You okay. kind of support yeah. it. Absolutely. I don't. I have another bill. I don't like oh, it. Oh, good. Good. We'll so talk about it. So get ready. Next. All right. So we could be moving the primary up or back, depending on how you look at it, from September to August, if the General Assembly approves the Secretary of State's uh, proposal and passes a new law, all to accommodate the federal mandates for our military who need their stuff to vote 45 days in advance. Uh, by the way, I'm not sure that that's true. I don't know why the feds are, are calling 45 days. I don't know if that's arbitrary. No, or no, no. I mean, think about when you have soldiers out in the middle of nowhere um, or, or out in, you know, in Korea deployed. I mean, and actually, it, for Rhode Island, this is a real issue because we have one of the most active rates of deployment for our National Guards men and women of any state. Hmm. Okay. So it's a serious issue. So you want to you want to get early voting in. What's yes. your what's your proposal? Yes. So my proposal is and and you have to look at it in the context of everything that I've done. I really believe that improving access to the ballot box can be done at the same time as you protect the integrity of every vote. Now, in Rhode Island, it turns out we have three ways that you can vote. Sure, you can vote on election day, but you can also ask for a ballot to be mailed to your house if you ask for it at least 21 days before the election. And in that time period between... Defined as a mail ballot? A mail ballot. Or an absentee ballot? Yes. Or an emergency ballot? No, what, no, what? a mail ballot. Just a plain mail ballot. It, it's, it comes in the mail. Generic mail ballot. Yep. Please and, send it to me. Yes. And, and by the way, I, I put money in the budget to make sure that, you know, it's already postage prepaid so that you don't have to worry about, like, it's an odd size envelope, now I have to go to the post office. No, you can literally, you don't have to give it to anybody. You can just put it into the mailbox yourself. Okay. And it goes. All right. Then you have the time period that's 20 days before the election, right? Between the mail ballot and election day. That it was that has historically been called in Rhode Island emergency mail ballots. And historically, back in the olden days, you had to swear that you had some sort of incapacity, that you couldn't make it to the polling locations, that you suddenly got called for work, whatever. And you had to swear to that. Now, a few years back, I think in 2011, I think it was, um, the law was changed, and now they basically allowed for the fact that you could say, look, I just can't make it that day, and so I want the ballot now. And so it's no longer really requiring an emergency. And you go to town hall for it. And you go to town hall for it. Now, that used to be something that not many people knew. And I, I believe strongly that people should know what their options are. So we've told Rhode Islanders, you have these three options for voting, and guess what? They've taken us up on it. So. Regular mail ballots went up by 47% in the last cycle, and in the last cycle, we saw a 119% increase in emergency mail ballots. So people are coming into city and town hall and saying, I want to vote today. I can't wait for election day. I don't know what that day's going to be like. I need it now. All right. So my bill... I get, I'm, I'm good on those provisions. Okay. They, they are user-friendly mm -hmm. provisions. But a concept of just... Let's start this sucker, what, five or seven days in front or 20 days in front? What do well, you want to do? So, no, no. So, so I am literally, all this bill does is it keeps the same structure. So 20 days before the election, which is the same that you have right now. You would call it early in-person voting. It would no longer be emergency mail ballot. It would be early in-person voting. And the city or town would find a polling location in coordination with the Board of Elections that they would want to do it, whether it be city or town hall or somewhere else. Um, and that would be a polling location. And you would show up, and you would have to show your ID, and you would be checked off in the e-poll book. Um, if for some reason you, your ID, there was a problem, you would do a provisional ballot. It would be a polling location. We have location. other states that are doing it. Yes. What is the percentage of voter turnout early? 
Oh, it's pre been it's day. been actually increasing. I don't I don't remember off the top of my head, but but the increase is I want to single it's, digits. Is no, it no, no, 20, it's like, 30, it's 40%? like no, it's like something in the high forties. Like I say, like forty six, forty seven percent increases, like over time. So like I think in the last election, like forty six or forty seven percent actually voted early, uh, around of the electorate overall. So hmm. so you have thirty nine states and DC that right now allow early in person voting. Let's call it what it is. Let's not hide between behind the thing of like emergency mode because that will still hold people back from using it if they think they have to have an emergency. Let's call it what it is: early person voting. Let's have a real polling location so things can run smoothly because right now it's a really paper-intensive process that's driving the local boards of canvassers and the board of elections nuts because each one of those ballots, those emergency mail ballots, has to be reviewed. I just I just wonder what the media mm -hmm. and and candidate relationships are going to be like if we go this way and really start to have a heavy pipeline early. I mean, Columbus Day will feel like the last day for a, a gubernatorial debate when mm -hmm. you're running in 2022 for governor. Uh, and right? Right, 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 right. Very cute, very cute. No, seriously, right? 2022 is a whole lifetime away. Oh, damn. <laughs> uh, but whomever. Good try. Right? Yes. Uh, but, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it, no, this, it's going so to affect, you know, Tim White's, Ted DC's annual debate. But, uh, now it better be by October because half the viewership has already voted. I, I, I'm just... I, no, no, no. But here's the thing. We, you know, th this is really geared to the person who I think really we need to worry about, which is the voter. So the last piece of this legislation, by the way, that, that it allows actually for weekend voting on Saturday and Sunday before the election. A lot of people can't make it in to city or town See, hall I hate in the that. middle of the day. I hate that. I mean, I, I, I hate it because, look, I'm a quality versus quantity guy when it comes to voting. I don't want somebody who's out shopping going, oh, yeah, I didn't vote. Well, we'll stop by before I have my, uh, my McChicken sandwich and I'm going to go uh, <laughs> cast a vote. I want it to be purposeful. And I want it to be informed, and I think this dumbs that down. I think I, I, I'm going to push back on you respectfully and say that I believe that early voters actually are informed voters, and they are taking time out of their life. They're they're actually taking time out of their lives, which in many cases could involve commutes, children, parents that they're taking care of during the week, and they can't make it, and they can only do so if they go on a Saturday or Sunday before the election. So I I don't think that one is necessarily correlates to the other. But we can agree to disagree. Well, well, I think it requires a little bit more study. It's more of my hunch than anything yeah. else. Um, so thank you for uh, letting everybody know that you're running for governor in 2022. Appreciate your, I your announcing here early. I am running the Secretary of State's office and, with uh, passion and But did you notice the intense. smile? The smile is like, mm, it's about the best I'm going to get, but it's all I can get by 2019, for heaven's sake. You know. Good to see you. It's very early. Very early. You didn't say lot, no. Lot, you just said it was very early. Lot to do. Final word when we come back. I want to be around tomorrow night. Bob Walsh from the National Education Association talks to me about extending contracts on an evergreen basis. And I really want to find out why the teacher union is complaining so much about this proposal to close the loopholes on physical relationships between teachers and students. It's got to stop. And it's not just, well, what about everybody else? No. What about the relationship between teacher and student? Tomorrow night. See you on the radio at 3-2 on WPRO. Bye.